committee will come to order. This is a hearing on uh, H.R. 735, the Project Labor Agreements Restoring Competition and Neutrality to Government Construction Projects. Uh, the Oversight uh, Committee mission statement, we read at every one of our committee meetings. Let me just go ahead and read it to us. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know that what they get from their government. We work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. I have an opening statement. I am going to submit it for the record for the sake of our time today. And then I will also allow any members to have seven days to submit opening statements and any extraneous material for the record. We will now recognize our very first panel. Uh, this is the Honorable John Sullivan. He represents Oklahoma's first district. He is up the turnpike from me personally. He introduced H.R. 735, the Government Neutrality and Contracting Act of February of this year. And uh, glad to have you, Congressman Sullivan. Thanks for taking time out of your schedule to get a chance to do a, uh, a statement for us today. You are given and yielded five minutes. Well, thank you, Chairman Lankford and uh, Ranking Member Conley, uh, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for holding this hearing today. Every day of this Congress has brought us face to face with tough decisions on spending cuts, cost saving proposals, policies that encourage job creation and ways to preserve the American dream for our posterity. It is clear now more than ever that each fisc fiscal decision that Congress makes has an impact on the sustainability of America's prosperity. I bring to your attention today H.R. 735, the Government Neutrality and Contracting Act, which will save jobs, create jobs, and prevent the waste of taxpayer dollars on Federal, federal and federally assisted construction projects by reestablishing fair and open competition. To begin, a project labor agreement is a contract that typically forces contractors and subcontractors to agree to recognize unions as the representatives of their employees on that job in order to win a construction contract. PLAs typically force contractors to use the union hiring hall and pay fringe benefits into union managed benefit and pension programs. PLAs also contain clauses that force contractors and employees to obey the restrictive and inefficient work rules and job classifications common in union collective bargaining agreements but absent in the standard operation of open shop contractors. While, this is a technically, while it is technically true that any contractor is welcome to compete on or for projects that require a government mandated PLA, both general contractors and subcontractors must agree to, to the terms and conditions of a PLA in order to win a contract. The practical effect of these agreements is to discourage competition from contractors opposed to the terms of the PLA. In 2001, President George Bush issued Executive Order 13202 and 13208 to maintain government neutrality in Federal contracting. These executive orders prohibited the government from requiring contractors to adhere to PLAs as a condition of winning Federal or Federally funded construction contracts. Because President Bush's executive order was about maintaining neutrality, a contractor could also voluntary, voluntarily enter into a PLA if they felt it could make their business competitive and deliver the best product to the government. However, in 2009, President Obama issued, issued Executive Order 13502, encouraging Federal agencies to require union favoring PLAs on Federal construction projects exceeding $25 million in total costs. While President Obama's executive order does not mandate PLAs on all Federal construction contracts, it does nothing to preserve the neutrality that government, government should maintain. Rather, it exposes Federal procurement officials to intense political pressure from special interest groups, politicians, and political appointees to require PLAs. As I and, other, and I and other panelists place the facts before you, you will see how this dangerous path, this is a dangerous path. Government mandated PLAs are not only discriminatory, but they are also hurtful to a struggling industry that is already facing unemployment above 17 percent. For example, yesterday the Wall Street Journal reported on a $70 million highway construction contract in New York, funded at least 80 percent by the Federal Highway Administration. 
that has been scrutinized for the decision to subject it to a PLA. While 27 percent of New York's private construction workforce is unionized, that means that the employers of 73 percent of New York's construction workforce who have been facing steep job losses over the past few years are discouraged from bidding on this project. Unfortunately, limiting competition comes at taxpayer expense. The article mentions that the PLA costs taxpayers an additional $4.5 million because the lowest respons responsible bidder, a merit shop contractor, was thrown off the project in favor of a union contractor because the merit shop contractor would not sign a PLA. Executive Order 13502 states its purpose is to promote efficiency. However, there is little evidence to suggest PLAs promote efficiency in Federal contracting. There were no examples of inefficiencies during the Bush years when PLA mandates were restricted. I am aware of an anecdote, anecdotal evidence on recent Federal construction projects demonstrating an increase in the construction costs that may not provide corresponding benefits to taxpayers or construction owners. For instance, the U.S. General Service Administration renovation project of Lafayette Federal Building in Washington, D.C. was awarded to a Federal contractor without a PLA at a $52.3 million cost. However, after the contractor agreed to a PLA for the project by the GSA, the contractor added $3.3 million to the cost of the project. The added $3.3 million isn't the result of increased material costs, revised blueprints, or more ag aggressive completion deadline. The contract was awarded to the same contractor with the same proposal, and the only difference was the PLA. There are just two examples. Though these are just two examples, but there is no doubt that there are many more stories reflecting the true colors of government-mandated PLAs. When mandated by public officials, these agreements unfairly discourage competition from 87 percent of the entire U.S. private construction workforce, effectually raise the employment rate of the industry, cost the government billions more in construction costs, and do nothing to increase the efficiency of Federal construction projects. There is a solution. H.R. 735, the Government Neutrality and Contracting Act, will prohibit executive agencies and recipients of Federal funds from requiring contractors to agree to PLAs as a condition of winning a Federal construction contract. contract contractors are free to enter into PLAs if they want to, but the government is removed from that decision-making process. If enacted, this bill guarantees that all qualified contractors and their skilled workforces, regardless of labor affiliation, can compete on a level playing field. This expands job opportunities, reduces the costs of government, and prevents discrimination based on labor affiliation. All told, H.R. 735 will ensure that taxpayers get the best possible product at the best possible price. Once again, thank you, Chairman Lankford, for all you are doing. Thank you, Ranking Member uh, Conley, he is not here, but, and uh, all the members of the subcommittee. Thank you very much, and I appreciate this opportunity to address your committee. Thank you, Congressman Sullivan, for taking time out of your schedule today to come over and testify. Uh, many of you may or may not know that we have a vote that is coming very soon, and there is already a debate on the floor, which was originally unscheduled during this time period, so I appreciate you coming over. We can take a short recess to allow the clerks to set up for the second panel real quick, and look forward to getting a chance to introduce our second witnesses. Thank you. We will now welcome our second panel. The Honorable Daniel Gordon is the Administrator for the Federal Procurement Policy, the Office of Management and Budget. Very grateful to have you here, Mr. Gordon. And uh, for clarification for everyone that is here, Mr. Gordon and I talked three days ago, actually, about his schedule today, that he has got to get away for a flight by 11 o'clock. At that time, I told him we don't have votes scheduled on that morning, so we should be just fine.
now we have votes scheduled this morning. So when votes interrupt us, uh, I still will allow, obviously, Mr. Gordon to be able to slip away and be able to catch that flight and be able to get out of here regardless. So we are accelerating the process to get you to that quickly. Uh, Ms. Susan Britta is the Deputy Administrator of the General Service Administration. Pursuant to the committee rules, all witnesses are sworn in before they will testify. So if you would please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give to this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help me God. Let the record reflect the witnesses all answered in the affirmative. Please be seated. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I have a parliamentary inquiry. Absolutely, sir. Mr. Chairman, uh, I, too, want to see Mr. Lankford get out of here on time, and I know you will. But my staff has informed me that you, uh, Chairman Issa, and other chairmen of this committee have adopted a new policy for minority witnesses. This policy appears to contradict the rules and the precedent of our committee. We received word of this new policy for the first time from Chairman Issa's staff in an email on May 25th, and here is what it said. If there is an administration witness, then that witness is designated minority witness. It is up to the Chairman to accept an additional witness, but that witness must be recommended within the 24-hour period. In other words, if you invite someone from the administration, that witness is somehow designated as our witness, although we didn't ask for him. For this hearing, we did not request an administrative witness. You did. We requested Dr. Peter Phillips, an expert in economics of the construction industry, but you refused to allow him to testify. The reason your staff gave was Chairman Issa's new policy. They said we couldn't have our witness because you already invited administrative witnesses. Here is my inquiry. Has the subcommittee or the full committee formally adopted this policy? Uh, that we will have to determine. I will have to get with uh, Chairman Issa. I get a chance to chat about that specifically. Part of the, the issue as well, and I had a, this conversation with Ranking Member Connolly on it, is obviously we have seven people on this panel already as well, two of those being administration officials, and I recommended to him at that time that uh, the uh, minority witness submit something at length for the record and so we can get a chance to include that as well. Well, the only reason I am asking this is because I think it sets a dangerous precedent um, because quite often we are, we, are, we, are not, we are opposed to what the administration is doing. And so for us to be, for people to be designated our witnesses, it, it just uh, it creates a, a major problem. And um, so I, I just wanted to know that. And, on, and we just wanted to know on what basis did you deny Ranking Member Connolly's request to invite Dr. Phillips to today's hearing? What, what was the basis of that? The basis on that, that we, obviously we had seven people already and two of those being administration officials uh, that we thought would be very supportive uh, and would be very clear to articulate that position as well. Just one other thing. Second parliamentary inquiry. Further, um, Mr. Chairman, this new policy is not only unfair and unprecedented, but it directly contradicts the rules of the House and the rules of our committee. Committee, committee rule number two provides for, and I quote, witness, witnesses from the minority may request, and, and it says not the majority, the minority. The same is true in the rules of the House. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it is an obvious point, but you can't just invite people to testify and claim that we invited them. Can you show the members any basis in the rules for this new misguided policy? Why don't we get a chance to go through this uh, in the uh, following days, and I will follow up and show a previous record of how this committee has been handled in the past, and uh, we will be able to track that and be able to determine uh, if this is consistent with previous actions of the committee. And just one other thing, I just want to make it clear, because this is, very, this is a very dangerous precedent, and no previous chairman has ever designated who the minority witnesses would be, regardless of whether they are administrative officials or anyone else. Chairman Issa's new policy is an extreme edict, and I am aware of no other House or Senate committee with a similar policy. This policy un also undermines the integrity of our committee by impairing the ability of minority members to bring balance and additional perspectives to these proceedings. And I ask that uh, you state here to our members that you categorically reject this policy immediately. Will you do that, Mr. Chairman? Uh, I will not. I want to be able to look at the full record of the history of this committee and be able to determine in, in the previous on that. I understand, and, and understand what you are stating by that, but I want to be able to walk through the history of this committee as well. I understand. Mr. Chairman, I have a motion. Today I join all the ranking members of this committee in sending a letter to Chairman Issa formally objecting to this new policy and calling on him to abandon it. Here is what the letter says. Apart from these specific objections, we are concerned about the direction of your overall approach. 
rather than increasing bipartisan uh, cooperation, as you pledged to do many times, you have adopted this new policy without identifying any legitimate basis or need for it. This leads to the unfortunate conclusion that you are more interested in holding hearings to advance your own personal political agenda rather than objectively gathering facts from a variety of sources to improve public policy. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that this letter be entered into the record. Without objection. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. By the way, we are very limited in the time that we have. This is a conversation that we can have after Mr. Gordon has already testified. It would allow him to be able to slip out and be able to hear a witness. I understand, but as the ranking member of the subcommittee, I have a further parliamentary inquiry following up on Mr. Cummings' inquiry. Um, was the chairman suggesting that he believes there is precedent for the majority dictating to the minority who their witnesses would be at a hearing? What the chairman is stating is I want to walk back through the history of this and to be able to discover that clearly, and so we can all walk through it together and see area by area uh, as we have gone back through history to be able to determine that together. Would the chairman acknowledge that he was given verbal uh, objection by this ranking member to this proceeding? Yes, we discussed that actually prior to your arrival. And I, I'm, I know that since our witnesses are going to be under oath, um, they will testify that I have had no communication. The ranking member on the minority of this subcommittee did not request Mr. Gordon or Ms. Britta as witnesses. Would the chairman be aware of that? Uh, I would not be. Would you suggest that they would not be good witnesses to be able to no, speak to this I issue? No, I would suggest they were not my choice and that the minority has a right under the rules of the House and the rules of this committee mm -hmm. to choose its own witnesses. And this hearing is in violation of those rules, and I want to protest that publicly. I want the administration witnesses to understand that they are being used. Um, and I want that on the record. Without objection. Mr. Gordon, I very much be grateful to be able to receive your testimony for five minutes. Thank you. I will, I will speak briefly, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Langford, Ranking Member Conley, members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss issues related to the use of project labor agreements in Federal construction contracts. As the Chairman noted, uh, we talked earlier this week. I do have, unfortunately, a very firm travel commitment. I will have to leave at 11 o'clock this morning. I am very appreciative of the Chairman's and the subcommittee's understanding in that regard. As Administrator for Federal Procurement Policy, I am responsible for overseeing the development of government-wide contracting rules and policies and ensuring that those rules and policies promote economy and efficiency in government contracting. This morning, I am going to very briefly describe the steps that my office has taken to shape the Federal Acquisition Regulation, the FAR, rule that implements Executive Order 13502, which governs the use of PLAs in Federal construction contracts. Let me first address a possible misperception about what the FAR, rules, about what the FAR rule says about the use of PLAs. The FAR rule does not mandate the use of PLAs. Like the executive order, the FAR rule gives each contracting agency the discretion to decide for itself on a project-by-project -project basis whether use of a PLA will promote economy and efficiency in that specific construction contract. The FAR rule calls PLAs, and I am quoting from the rule, a tool that agencies may use to promote economy and efficiency in Federal procurement. In offering PLAs as a tool to the contracting agency, the FAR rule on PLAs is similar to many other provisions of the FAR. For example, the FAR lets contracting agencies decide, based on the specifics of their needs and their circumstances, whether they should purchase through the Federal supply schedule or on the open market whether they should seek bids with price as the only evaluation criterion or rather run a competitive procurement with other selection factors, such as past performance, in addition to price. The FAR doesn't dictate to our acquisition professionals what choices to make, but it gives them the tools to make the choices to tailor a procurement to the individual agency's specific requirement. That toolkit approach and the flexibility that comes with it lie at the very heart of our ability to get the best value for every taxpayer dollar we spend, whether we are buying lawn mowing services for a national park or warplanes for the Air Force. 
and our approach to PLAs is no different. We have structured the FAR rule to create a process where decisions are made on a case-by-case -case basis. The FAR rule sets out factors that an agency may, may decide to consider, but it does not dictate those factors or prohibit agencies from considering other factors. As with other FAR rules, though, the, the PLA rule sets boundaries. Most significantly, the agency can require a PLA for a specific project only only if it decides that doing that will advance the government's interest in achieving economy and efficiency in Federal procurement. Equally important with respect to the content of any PLA created pursuant to the FAR rule, the, the rule requires that the PLA allow all firms to compete for contracts and subcontracts without regard to whether they are otherwise parties to collective bargaining agreements. That mandate ensures that if an agency decides to, to use a PLA, it is done with, with, in a way consistent with the principle of open competition, a bedrock of our Federal procurement system. We appreciate that taxpayers would not benefit from a rule that mandated the use of PLAs even if they didn't make sense and didn't serve economy and efficiency. However, Similarly, taxpayers would not benefit from a rule if agencies were prohibited from taking advantage of opportunities where a PLA could help them achieve or increase efficiency and timeliness. With these thoughts in mind, our office, the Office of Federal Procurement Policy, intends to work with agencies to facilitate the sharing of experiences and best practices for the consideration and appropriate use of project labor agreements in the Federal marketplace. I am very happy to answer any questions when we come to question time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. Ms. Britt, I would be pleased to be able to receive your testimony for five minutes. Uh, good morning, Chairman Langford and Ranking Member Connolly and other members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me here today to discuss GSA's measured business approach to the implementation. Ms. Britt, I hate to interrupt you. Could we get your microphone a little bit closer to you so I will be able to hear? Is this better? That is great. Thank okay. you. Good morning. I will say that again. Thank you again for inviting me here to discuss GSA's measured business approach to the implementation of project labor agreements in our construction contracts. A PLA is a proven tool to help provide structure and stability to any project, especially on large, complex projects. The private sector uses PLAs for a variety of construction projects similar to those that GSA manages. PLAs are also used at the State and local levels for a wide array of construction projects varying in size and scope. PLAs have been used in all 50 States and the District of Columbia. They can help reduce risks associated with wage stability, avoidance of work stoppages, increase labor availability and project-specific coordination on work uh, rules. PLAs can also include provisions that promote career development through valuable job training for construction workers. GSA only uses PLAs when they promote economy and efficiency in Federal procurement. Executive Order 13502 and the FAR encourage executive agencies to consider requiring contractors to use PLAs on projects totaling at least $25 million. The Executive Order does not mandate that Federal agencies require PLAs, but encourages the consideration of PLAs. Our procurement process provides for the consideration of PLAs. GSA allows contractors to submit a proposal with a PLA, without a PLA, or you can submit both. We evaluate these proposals on a project-by-project -project basis. If GSA accepts a PLA proposal, the awardee is required to execute a PLA in accordance with the executive order and the FAR. In GSA's contracts, the PLA is an agreement between the contractor and the labor organization rather than between GSA and the labor organization. For our major construction projects, GSA typically selects the proposal representing best value for the government by weighing a number of technical factors against cost. A PLA recently has been included as one of these technical factors. Proposals with the PLA receive 10 percent of the total possible points for evaluation. We award to contractors who work with labor organizations as well as contractors who do not. Shortly after the executive order was signed, GSA received $5.5 billion through the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. These funds, which were used principally to help modernize and green our federally owned inventory, provided GSA the opportunity to conduct a PLA pilot program. For this pilot program, GSA selected 10 projects with budgets 
uh, of over $100 million. The selected projects covered seven states and the District of Columbia. Of these 10 projects, seven ended up with PLAs and three did not. From our comparisons, in most instances, there has been no too little different cost, a cost difference. Our experience in this pilot program has shown us that our bidding process has not, been, has not hindered competition. In all of our projects, we receive sufficient bids to ensure adequate competition and best value for the American taxpayer. We typically receive between three and eight offers for these projects. Through the construction of these projects, GSA plans to assess the use of PLAs for future implementation of best practices and update our policies. This pilot program has enabled GSA to obtain real market data regarding the impact of PLAs on competition. GSA has recently reached out to contractors and union officials to hear their feedback on our pilot projects in order to develop ways to further improve the PLA procurement process. As real estate experts, GSA ensures that we are uh, procuring construction goods and services at best value for the American government on behalf of the American taxpayer. The consideration of PLAs is encouraged because of the benefits associated with them. PLAs can provide wage stability for workers, establish mechanisms for resolving labor disputes, and reduce the risk of work strikes and lockouts to ensure projects continue on schedule. In awarding construction contracts, GSA considers a variety of technical factors, including the potential benefits of a PLA, and weighs them against cost to help determine the winning proposal. By leveraging our experience and expertise, GSA ensures high design and construction excellence at best value for the American taxpayer. Thank you, Chairman Linkford, and I am prepared to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. President. I uh, now yield myself five minutes uh, for initial questioning. Uh, Mr. Gordon, as, as I am going through this issue, um, when, when a PLA agreement is made, uh, does that change the collective bargaining rights typical for a union when they are coming in? Do they have to set aside some of those rights to be able to enter into a PLA agreement? Mr. Chairman, I, I, unfortunately, I am not a labor lawyer. I am a procurement <laughs> guy, and I am not sure what the impact would be on individual collective bargaining agreements. When, when, when this was made, w w the shift that occurred uh, in the uh, executive order, was that because PLAs were being excluded? Uh, there was an executive order that was done two years ago that you, you said didn't elevate the PLAs on it, but it put them, uh, encouraged uh, the use of PLAs on it. Was that because PLAs uh, were more efficient, but they weren't being selected. I am trying to figure out the reason that the executive order is needed. If already PLAs are allowed, if already uh, that is in the process, and, and this, what we are talking about today, does not exclude PLAs and says, no, they can't be used, what was the need for the executive order and how is that uh, bearing out? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, under the prior administration, the government was prohibited from requiring the use of PLAs on Federal construction projects. Uh, it is true that individual contractors could voluntarily use one, but what we have seen uh, what we have seen is that in both the private sector and in State and local governments, there are situations where PLAs are viewed as helpful, and our view was that same tools should be available to the Federal Government, just as it is available, for example, to Toyota when Toyota uh, used project labor agreements, and as the Department of Energy has required use of project labor agreements for many decades. We wanted that to be possible for the entire Federal Government. We weren't encouraging their use. We were encouraging agencies to consider whether they should be required. Is there in, in increased points that are given uh, in the benefit uh, for uh, use of a PLA? I'm not sure what you mean by increased points. Uh, in, 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 the, in the scoring and trying to determine the benefit of, of how to select a contractor, are there increased points that are given if they use a PLA? We have given agencies considerable flexibility in deciding how to implement the FAR rule. What you heard from Ms. Britta was that at GSA, a, a, a small percentage of points, it is really only on the technical side that you can get 10 extra, uh, 10 percent extra points, but technical is only one factor. There is also past performance and price. And, uh, and the, other and the agencies aren't taking that approach. Well, the, re the reason for that would be the 10 extra points was because of they saw increased efficiency and, and such, or what was the reason for giving the, the extra points for that to say? It would be better ask, to ask Ms. Okay. Ms. Well, Britta. That would be great. Let, let, let me shift. Ms. Britta, what, what was the reason for the extra points on that? We, uh, we chose, GSA chose to uh, enter into the 10 percent um, uh, preference. Uh, as you know, the executive order 
encourages uh, agencies to consider. We are in the construction business and we are always looking for ways sure. to increase competition and obviously make things more efficient. Uh, in the uh, application of the uh, executive order, we chose to use the 10 percent uh, point system to, to, to meet that encouragement, to, to encourage people to participate and, and uh, get involved. In when you mention the pilot program, is that the Ryder Leverett Bucknall? Report the Ryder Leverett Bugnall report is that the when you're talking about the pilot program earlier that did the study on PLAs is that the report you're referring to the company that did the report? No, the pilot program I'm talking about is the uh, the ten projects that we identified that we were going to uh, uh, run the PLA against right. and see how how the ten projects stacked up. The report is is a different report. The okay. report is a different effort. Okay, that that report though you're familiar with that report? I am fairly familiar with it. That the report I have, I have a draft copy of it. it uh, the last revision of that looks like it was January the 27th, 2010. Our, our staff has been trying to request this report, obviously, because it is good that you all have done a study and be able to track. It is the right thing to be able to do on it. We have been trying to get a copy. We are finally able to get a copy of this actually at 6 p.m. last night, mm -hmm. uh, just of the draft. But the last draft was actually done January 27th, 2010. Uh, I would like to with, uh, ask unanimous consent that we submit this report for the record. So agreed. In this report, there are several statements that come out on it in the executive summary, even at the beginning of it. Uh, it, it talks through these different cities and these different locations. And it talks through, for instance, in Cleveland, there is a 0.1 percent uh, marginal benefit to PLA, a 0.6 percent benefit in Honolulu, a 0.3 percent benefit in San Francisco. But then it walks through other cities that the PLAs were studies and saying that in other cities, Portland, Oregon, Nogales, Arizona, Denver, Colorado, Washington, D.C., all had increased costs uh, by using PLAs, some of them as high as 12 percent more expensive. So it is not 0.12, but 12 percent on the other side, 5.8 percent more expensive in Colorado. Uh, the, the dramatic. And then it also lists there is a risk in using PLAs exclude small and minority businesses and may exclude capable marriage shop contractors and other factors related to this. Uh, this was a very interesting report to go through last night. My, my question is, this has been out here for a year and a half and it is still in draft form. At what point is this in its final form or will it actually be released to everyone? Well, Chairman Langford, the agency made a decision that we would suspend further work on that report and, and really work toward um, applying market forces to the to the. Is, is that because of the findings of this report? Because this report, this report does not support what you were saying on the pilot program. This support is, is fairly discouraging of PLAs. It does say, find like 0.3 percent benefit in certain cities, but it is very discouraging on the whole of using PLAs. Well, the, the report is drafted and it is not final. So it, but it has been drafted for a, a year and a half. I am trying to figure out how long does it take to finish a report that is inconsistent with the government policy? Well, we decided to suspend action on that report and move toward the consideration of let, letting the marketplace determine with the uh, applicability of PLAs rather than rely on a report. We okay, so wait. So the report wasn't consistent with the policy, and so the report is set aside, and, and we have suspended no, the report exactly because the policy was inconsistent with it. That is what I am trying to figure out the why. What, what was in this report? Was it sloppily done? Was it the, the findings uh, weren't, weren't consistent with other reports that were done? Or wh why was this suspended? The, the report was suspended because we wanted to get real market data quickly and we were moving through our recovery projects. So we felt that it would be a better use of our time and, and quite frankly, more efficient to try to get real market data quickly by, by um, encouraging the use of PLAs in this, this uh, collection of projects. This, these projects were chosen uh, because we felt they had they were large cities, small cities, they were major construction renovations. So we thought that that would be a better uh, way to gather data quickly, quite frankly, than, than wait for the report. So we suspended work on the report and went to the actual application of the PLAs in some of our projects. Okay. Well, I have exceeded my time. I apologize for that. And I would like to yield to uh, Mr. Connolly, a ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Britta, by the way, I recognize that accent. Yes, Boston? Sir. Yes, sir. Where? Boston, High Park. High Park. Um, my family lives in West Roxbury. Oh, I and I can talk that way if I have to. I used to, I used so to, welcome. I used to go great, to church and say it. Uh, great to hear the name. accent. Um, uh, well, I got you, Ms. Britta. Uh, who invited you to come to this hearing? Uh, the chairman did. The chairman. Did you hear anything from my office or me? I did not, sir. So you were not invited by the minority? No, sir. I was, I, you don't consider yourself a minority witness, therefore? I received a letter from the chairman and I had uh, a conversation with his chief counsel. Mr. Gordon, same question. Who invited you here? Same answer, sir. 
So you did not hear from me or from my office? Uh, we had, as far as I know, no contact with your office at all. So as far as you know, you were not invited here by the minority? That is right, sir. Um, let me just say again, uh, sadly, you are both being used uh, in violation of House Rule 11, Clause 2J1, which states explicitly the minority members of the committee shall be entitled upon request to the chair by a majority of them before the completion of the hearing to call witnesses selected by the minority to testify with respect to that measure of matter. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, it has never been customary in the House or the Senate to, for the majority to determine who the minority witnesses are, let alone to determine on their behalf, by the way, because the administration happens to be of the same party, therefore you are our witnesses. And uh, I want you to both know that at least this ranking member, and perhaps I will be joined by the ranking member of the full committee, I am going to advise the administration to decline all requests by the majority to testify before this subcommittee and the full committee until this matter is resolved, because for you to testify is to be unwittingly complicit in the violation of House rules and the committee rules and to tread on the rights of the minority. And so I hope you both will take that back to your respective agencies. I am going to be talking to the White House and to administration, government relations officials. Um, and I would hope that the administration would cooperate with us in a policy of non-cooperation until this matter is cleared up. But the minority has rights. And if the uh, majority wishes to actually uh, join on this issue and dare to tell us who our witnesses will be and to designate administration witnesses as our witnesses against our wishes, then we are going to advise that administration to not cooperate with the members of the majority until, the, until our rights are recognized and respected. And with that, I yield to the, minority, uh, the ranking minority member of the full committee. I want to associate, thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. I, um, I want to associate myself with every syllable of the uh, words of Mr. Connolly. Uh, Administrator Gordon and Deputy Administrator Britta, I appreciate your testimony and your views you have provided today. As I stated, start, stated at the start of the hearing, it is critical that this committee conduct fair and responsible oversight. That is why I am particularly disappointed that Chairman Lankford decided to deny the minority's request for a witness, Dr. Peter Phillips, Chair of the Economics Department at the University of Utah, citing a misguided and unprecedented committee policy. If Dr. Phillips had been allowed to testify in person today, uh, I would have asked him to discuss the credibility of the 2009 study by the Beacon Hill Institute. That study criticizes the use of PLAs on Federal construction projects. Instead, I directed my staff to put uh, this question to Dr. Phillips in writing, and he has graciously responded in writing. Had the majority been allowed to bring Dr. Phillips forward, he would have told the subcommittee that the Beacon Hill study, and I quote, has not been vetted in any peer review process and would be unlikely to survive a peer review, end of quote. Had Dr. Phillips been allowed to present live testimony at this hearing, he would have also questioned using Beacon Hill's analysis as a basis for the claim that PLAs raise construction costs by reducing competition. Dr. Phillips would have noted that, and I quote, Beacon Hill's work suffers from the basis, basic statistical fallacy of spurious correlation, end of quote. And he would go on to say, statistically, one could easily show that pom-poms uh, stunt teenage growth. All you have to do is go to a high school a basketball game and put all those uh, holding pom-poms on one side of the room and all the remaining teenagers who uh, just happen to be the basketball players on the other. Lo and behold, all those holding pom-poms uh, have stunted growth compared to the control group. Now, this is Dr. Uh, my, the witness is saying this, Dr. Phillips. Similarly, Beacon Hill put all the complex jobs on one side and all the simple jobs on the other. Lo and behold, because the simple jobs did not have PLAs and most of the complex jobs did, PLAs cost more money. This sort of simple minded statistics just does not pass muster. End of quote. And I just ask you, uh, Ms. Britta, uh, you said you all changed course. Can, is, 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 does that have anything to do with it? In other words, trying to get a better sample of what you wanted to, so that you had more accurate information? We wanted a better sample, but we also wanted information quickly, uh, Mr. Cummings, because we were trying to evaluate the value, quite frankly, of PLAs. 
and there's a lot of academic literature out there, and we wanted some real data. And we felt we had an opportunity with our recovery projects and uh, the application of PLAs to some of these recovery projects. So we put together a list that we thought was a representative sample of what GSA uh, does in real time every day. And, and we ran the PLAs against these projects. So it was really an effort to gain information quickly and to do an evaluation and, and uh, to really to come to some conclusion, more conclusions about what uh, the value of PLAs in Federal construction projects, at Thank least you very as they much. relate to GSA. Thank you very much, Chairman. You go back. And with that, I yield to Mr. Wahlberg. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, in light of the fact that we have these witnesses in front of us, uh, I guess we might make best use. So thank you for being here. Um, Ms. Britta, uh, your list of PLA, non-PLA projects identifies the GSA headquarters building as a no PLA. Uh, wasn't that awarded originally as a PLA project, and what happened to the PLA? Yes, sir. It was originally awarded as a PLA project. The contractor was unable to finalize the arrangements with the various um, labor units, and so the contract was amended to take the PLA out of the requirements of the contract. But the, uh, Con remember, the, the arrangement is between the contractor and the, and the various labor unions, not GSA. And when the contract was unable to finalize those agreements, we just amended the contract and took it out. How much, it out. How much time, then, did the contractor have to waste trying to negotiate PLA with the unions on this project at uh, GSA's insistence before you allowed the project to go forward on a non-PLA basis? Let me just check with the staff. How long did we give them to negotiate? About 45 days, Mr. Wahlberg. 45 days. Yes, so that is the standard time to negotiate these kinds of things after award. Well, significant, especially when uh, uh, tax dollars are being wasted. I would, uh, uh, in deference to the, the chairman of the committee, yield back time. Thank you, Mr. Wahlberg. I just have a quick question. I would be honored to be able to yield, yield back if you would like to have that time as well. The, the Beacon Hill report that was being referenced by Mr. Cummings just a moment ago uh, was not the report I was referencing, and I hope I didn't try to allude to a different report. It is your report. The GSA report is the one that I was referencing that was uh, done by Ryder Leverett Bucknall, but it is actually a GSA-sponsored report and it is a GSA detail. So uh, I am not familiar with the report that he was mentioning before on that. So I wanted to be able to just clarify uh, that this is a different report. This is specifically a GSA-sponsored report that, that outlines that, that the project labor agreements can cause small and minority businesses to be excluded and that it also shows significant cost differences in multiple municipalities. Now, I, I would be, I'd be one to say PLAs are, should be in the toolbox. This is not anti-PLA to say they are in the toolbox. We are just questioning why there is an encouragement to use them when the GSA's own study says that it often causes cost increase based on this study. Well, Mr. Chairman, um, I will repeat again, the study is still in draft form. It is not finalized, and it has never been formally presented to the It hasn't been finalized, and we are relying on the real-time data to, to address those very issues about whether it is exclusionary, whether it is inclusionary, whether we have minority participation, women participation. Uh, we believed that getting real-time data with contracts that we are currently engaged in was a better approach and, a better, a be quite frankly, a better use of time because we will get information quicker. Do you have any idea what the cost of this report is that has been set aside I, of forming a report I like this? I can, uh, I can get back to you and, and uh, submit that information for the record. Thank you. I would much appreciate that, just to be able to know if we have suspended a report because it wasn't consistent with the original executive order to be able to get different sets of data on it. I right. would be interested to know what the cost of this report was that does not support the PLAs versus the cost of now finding data that does support PLAs on it. I will get so, it. I will submit that for the record. Thank you. That, Mr. Wahlberg, would you like to have, uh, yield back my time, Mr. Wahlberg? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me ask a question again, uh, Ms. Britta. Uh, why did the GSA agree to a $3.3 million change order in the Lafayette Building in Washington, D.C., uh, just to implement the PLA? Uh, Mr. Wahlberg, the project team led by the contract officer felt that in, in order, because it was a complex project, multi-phased project, expensive uh, very difficult location that the implementation of a PLA was in the best use of the taxpayers' dollars. It would keep the project on schedule, provide stable labor force, and the decision was made to amend the contract to include a PLA. Was this was? Uh, can I continue? Uh, was, Sorry, was, was, clock problems. Yes, you may. Was this the um, uh, 
uh, finding in the consultant study that you set aside uh, related not only to the GSA headquarters, but to also to the Lafayette building? I am unfamiliar with the finding, Mr. Wahlberg. What, I, I don't understand the was there a finding in the report? About well, it appears that in the study uh, you examined the issues of the, the Lafayette building, mm -hmm. the GSA headquarters at 1800 F Street, the projects, and both had PLA implementation mm -hmm. uh, at an additional cost. Um, and, and my concern is here, these, this additional cost was taxpayer expenditures based upon change of findings, uh, seeing that it would cost more. And you are saying it is only as a result of the technology, the ability, the complexity of the problem? Yes, I believe that the project team made the decision, in, certainly independent of the report. I am not even sure the project team is aware of the report. They made the decision because they felt, uh, given the nature of the project, and it is a very complex, expensive, multi-phased project, that the application of a PLA to this particular project would ultimately uh, be in the best interest of the project and, and uh, serve best value for the taxpayer. Well, that was a decision made by the project team led by the contract office. I guess I, I, I continue to express some of the same concern that when we have studies that are showing, uh, showing s significant uh, problems with PLAs, that, mm -hmm. that we are willing to uh, use the additional cost at taxpayers' expense. I yield back my time. Thank you. And I apologize for having some issues back and forth with the clock on that. We reset the clock at an appropriate time on that. That should be about five and a half minutes total in that colloquy. I recognize uh, Mr. Cummings, the ranking member of the full committee. Thank you very much. Um, let me uh, say this, to Ms. Britta. Uh, in my 15, almost 16 years in this Congress, uh, there is one agency that I have a tremendous amount of admiration for, for accuracy and doing the job right and doing it independently, and that is GSA. I don't want any of the employees at GSA looking at this and questioning whether we believe in what you do. And I, I just want to say that with the strongest words that I can muster out of this body. And I want to thank you all for what you do every day. But I want to go back uh, to, and I want to, uh, I understand what the Chairman was saying, Chairman Lankworth was saying with regard to the report, the Beacon Hill report. But I wasn't, I know he knows I wasn't trying to imply that. This is the very reason why we wanted to have our witness. The Beacon Hill report will be discussed extensively in the next panel, but we have no way to rebut it because we weren't able to call our witness. That's the problem. That's what I was trying to get to. So I have to, Mr. Zach, I have to do this. We have to do this to try to get our side's uh, opinion in on this hearing. Let me go back to um, regarding uh, H.R. 735, the legislation we are considering today. Um, and this is what I asked Dr. Phillips. I am continuing what, what I asked him, what he would have testified to. Dr. Phillips uh, would have explained with regard to this legislation that we just heard about, and I quote, PLAs are precisely the market instrument capable of setting and adjusting work rules to the specific needs of particular projects. Robbing the government of PLA contracts robs the government of the ability to address this issue uh, that critics claim is salient, end of quote. I, again, I, I say to the Chairman, I am disappointed that we did not have the opportunity to hear directly from uh, Dr. Phillips. By denying the minority its choice of witnesses, uh, you have denied the committee, and by that I mean the committee of the whole, uh, the balance uh, to conduct meaningful oversight. Um, and I ask unanimous consent that the letter from Dr. Phillips with written responses to my questions be placed in the record. Without objection. I might also add that I would have preferred to have him here so that he could put up his hand and swear to tell the truth, too, but this is how we have to do it. Um, Deputy Administrator Britta, as the branch of government responsible for both levying taxes and authorizing how the Federal Government spends American tax dollars, it is incumbent upon every member of Congress to ensure that the American people get the maximum value for every tax dollar spent. In Commissioner Peck's uh, testimony before the OGR subcommittee on regulatory affairs on the same topic in March, he stated that, and I quote, GSA only uses PLAs when they promote economy and efficiency in Federal procurement. Can you explain the process that GSA uses when determining whether or not to use a PLA in a construction project? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Mr. Cummings, when GSA uh, enters into a process to acquire a new Federal building, and they use a process called best value, 
uh, and source selection, actually. And the source selection panel is put together that evaluates all proposals, generally divided into two sections, a cost piece and a technical evaluation piece. The technical evaluation uh, section of a proposal has several uh, elements to it, uh, past performance, experience, uh, quality of personnel, uh, we have added a PLA. All of those are evaluated against cost. Uh, first, the technical piece is looked at, every proposal gets a score, then they match it against the cost, and they try to determine, the source selection panel determines the best value, which is a match of cost plus all the technical uh, qualities that are associated with the proposal. Uh, that is what the, uh, that's the process that the agency uses now. Uh, there is virtually no Federal agency now that goes straight, straight to low bid. They have found that that is just a waste of taxpayer dollars. You are buying junk with taxpayer dollars. You don't get best value. You have things that fall apart, whether it is a Federal building or whether it is a, you know, a, a, an Air Force fighter. You really get what you pay for. And we try at the agency, the way we handle our, pro our procurements now is to put those, those, that panel together, break proposals into your technical section and a price section, and then wed the two of them at the end of the evaluation period. So does that go to efficiency, effectiveness, and trying to make sure we get the best buck, I mean, the best value for our dollar? Yes, sir. Particularly in real estate. Um, um, there is an old saying in real estate, the time wounds all deals. And once you start a real estate process, you really need to keep it going, because once you stall, uh, money is, uh, particularly on the part of the developer who has borrowed money from a bank, the bank doesn't care. They are going to be charging you your daily rate on interest on the loan that you have incurred to, to build this project. So uh, it is very important that we look for ways to keep projects going. Once you make the decision, a lot of work is done prior to actually signing that contract. About a third of all the work associated with these projects is done prior to the contract. These we want to make sure once it is signed, we have a process in place to keep that project going forward, because it is extremely expensive when it stalls. And so we are always looking for ways. That is why the PLAs are attractive and an attractive tool for GSA, because the contractor makes it his responsibility to ensure that the labor is there, to, to make sure that there are no work stoppages, uh, to, to coordinate. One of the big problems is coordinating work schedules, making sure that harmonizing the work week is between the various labor groups. There is a harmonized work week so that everyone is working at the same time. Ms. Britter, thank you very much. And I just want you to know that what you just said, the reason for PLA seems to be pretty consistent with the, uh, our motto for this uh, committee. Uh, every time we meet, uh, they read this, we exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. By the way, this is written by Mr. Issa. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights, end of quote. I just want you to know that it is consistent. What you just said, the use of PLA seems to be consistent with the uh, goals of this uh, committee. And I want to thank you for your testimony. Thank you. And you yield uh, five minutes, Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would like to thank both witnesses for being here. Mr. Gordon, I have been with you before, and I appreciate you taking time to be with us also, Ms. Britta. Uh, you just said something about real estate time, what wounds all heals? That, 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 okay. that was a little saying we use, time wounds all deals. When you start a real estate deal, it is very important. And I understand that, but there is another saying that has been out there for a long time, and it is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to understand, and, and, and believe me, I'm not coming here representing Republicans, and I hope that this pan panel isn't about Republicans versus Democrats. It's about us representing the American people and making sure that as stewards of their hard-earned money that we're doing the best thing possible. I don't see where the PLAs at, at all fit in. And the, the, the troubling thing, this, the RLB report is something that was commissioned by the GSA. So I would assume that in your RFP you were very specific as to what it is that you wanted RLB to find out for you. And having coming from the private sector, where I've done a lot of RFPs, I've got to tell you, a 10 percent bonus doesn't level the playing field. That totally tilts it. As a, as a person who's done many bids, to see that in there and say, okay, fine, I, I mean, maybe that would, at the end of the day, make a difference, it's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I really I, I do wonder about these things. Just as a, a representative of the taxpayers and the, the, the citizens of the United States, where is it that we are going with these programs? I know the President uh, came out with this just weeks after being put in office. So there, 
Is there any instances anywhere where there is specific uh, instances showing where there are these labor stoppages or abuses or, or why the PLA was installed? Because I see it as exclusionary. I don't see it as increasing the field of bidders. I see it as narrowing it down and actually being exclusionary to those, the 87 percent of people who could bid on this project that will not be able to do it because they don't, in fact, have union labor. And I have nothing against unions, by the way. I represent a lot of union people. I have no problem with that. What I have a problem with is jobs. And jobs are important to anybody, whether you are a union member or you are a private citizen. We have got to get people back to work. So uh, the PLA uh, in this report is very troublesome to me. It has been there for a year and a half. If the RFP was, was put out by the GSA, then you, the, your office, maybe not you, your agency knew exactly what it was it was looking for. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that the information they got back is not consistent with what they were looking to find. And so if it, if it doesn't match my argument, we will set it aside and say it is irrelevant. And you, you can back shelf that and say it is still in draft form. But in a year and a half, I got to tell you, as an automobile dealer, if I had to wait for a year and a half on any bid that I put out, I would say the landscape's probably changed dramatically in a year and a half. So, if you could just briefly comment on that, I would appreciate it. Yes, sir, Mr. Kelly, just I just wanted to make one one point. Um, the ten percent is really not a bonus. It's not something that's added over and above the hundred points. It's part of the hundred points. If it's, it's if it's, it's not, not if it's not say, say that again. If you just repeat that, it's you, not. I think you used the word the the ten percent or the ten points is quote a bonus. Uh, it's really not in addition to the hundred points that one would normally. Then get. why is it in there? It's it's part of the hundred. It, it's part of the technical. It's but it's a ten point advantage if you. It's, it's a 10-point preference that the contractor can choose to take well, advantage of. Yeah, I got to tell you, as a guy that has been out in the real world, that is a heavy car cover charge. Well, so if that is part of what the, what the proposal is, that is not really trying to get to the best price. That is changing the scope of who it is that is able to bid. And I, mm -hmm. Listen, I can tell you, and I mean this sincerely, being in the private sector all my life, you set those type of parameters you are setting them to get one type of a bidder to get the award. Mm -hmm. I have watched it happen. I have lost out on too many bids where there is exclusionary language in there and it makes it impossible for an independent bidder to sometimes get in the door, get their foot in the door. And that is the purpose of RFPs. They are supposed to be consistent. This tilts it. Mr. Kelly, one of the reasons that we are um, doing this pilot program is to address th those very issues. To date, we have not seen uh, a, a great variance, quite frankly, between those that bid and those that don't bid when we have the PLA involved. But when we finish the report, um, we will be, we'll be able to, with much more definition, get at those very issues that you are talking about. Um, we don't, we don't, the agency does not believe that PLAs are exclusionary. In fact, we think it opens the, the labor market up because it includes union as well as non-union workers. So we take a different, it's a, it's a tool that the agency that can use and that the contractors take advantage of. It's a contractor choice. Well, what, let me ask you this. You say it opens the market up. What was excluding the market from being open before? This is just encouraging. Um, nothing was, this just makes the process more attractive. See, I, I differ with you on that. There is language set in there that is exclusionary. That is not including a wider a wider universe of bidders. What you are doing is you are favoring one bidder over another. It is, man, please, I have done bids all my life. When you put language in a bid that gives a 10 point, whether it is out of 100 points or whatever it is, right. advantage, that is exclusionary. And that is discouraging all bidders from the entire universe to bid on it. I have been involved in it too many times, and I have been excluded because I refuse to, to be a partner of that type of thing. So I, I really, I would, I would just suggest to you that while you may be saying that it opens the universe to other bidders, it absolutely does not. It is exclusionary. May I say a couple of words, Mr. Kelly? Absolutely. Uh, we, are, we in OMB are watching what the agencies are doing. We are giving agencies discretion, but we are very sensitive to the point you raise. We want to be sure that this is not an exclusionary process. We want to be sure that, the, that PLAs are viewed as only a tool. I think it is noteworthy in the GSA work that among the ten, there were instances where the bidder offering a PLA won. There were instances where the, B the bidders offering the PLAs did not win. This was not tilted one way or another, as I understand it. And I don't think the few points, and by the way, it is really less than 10, because cost is separate from that, that whole point scheme. I, I don't think that there are instances, at least not many instances, where those few points made any difference in who won or who and, didn't and win. I, and I understand where you are coming from, but I got to tell you, in the private world, when you are spending your own money, that is a huge difference. And only in this town 
do these matters become insignificant? Now, you are using the 10 instances that you looked at, but you refused to look at the, the report that was drafted a year and a half ago and saying, well, there is not enough information in there yet. However, we did have 10 other studies that we find uh, really, really speak to what it is that we are talking about. And I am telling you, as a taxpayer and as a person watching taxpayer funds, this is not the right road to go on. I thank, the, I thank the gentleman. Uh, the time has expired, and I would, I would uh, ask deference from uh, Mr. Gordon and Ms. Britta if you would be able to stay around a little longer. Our chairman has left the vote. He will be back to continue the hearing. Uh, we have nine seconds to get to our vote right now, and uh, then we will come back as well. We will stay until 11 o'clock. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, we will stand in recess.